I want to be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. You're listening to the Producer's Perspective Podcast with your host, Tony Award winner, Ken Davenport. Hey everybody, Ken Davenport here. On today's podcast, director-choreographer Bobby Longbottom is going to tell you all about the origins of Sideshow and how he got his career started on Broadway by coming up with the ideas himself and how he made them happen. Uh, but before we get to that, I want to first of all thank you all for the continued great reviews on iTunes and all the other platforms where you listen to your podcast. Please do go ahead and give us some stars and some love. It would mean a lot to the guests and also to me. Uh, and lastly, before we get on with the podcast, this week's episode is brought to you by the brand new off-Broadway hit, The Book of Merman. That's right, The Book of Merman. Get it? Uh, Book of Merman is about two Mormon missionaries who knock on Ethel Merman's door. A uh, hilarity that ensues in this new off-Broadway hit, now playing weekends at St. Luke's Theater at 46th and 8th Avenue. Uh, Logo TV called The Book of Merman, a must-see show off-Broadway. It stars YouTube sensation Carly Sakaloff. Definitely go ahead and get your tickets now. Uh, it actually is written by one of our Inner Circle clients here at the Producers Perspective Pro, Leo Schwartz. Again, Book of Merman now playing Fridays at 8 o'clock, Saturdays at 7.30, and Sundays at 2 o'clock, three shows a week at St. Luke's Theater. Tickets available through telecharge.com. It's very, very funny. Go see it. And now, on with the podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Producer's Perspective podcast. My name is Ken Davenport. Uh, we're recording this the day before Thanksgiving, so let me start by saying how thankful I am for all of you and all your great reviews and feedback. And I'm very thankful to have today's guest on the podcast, the Tony-nominated director, choreographer, Mr. Bobby Longbottom. Welcome, Bobby. Hello, Ken. How are you? So Bobby directed and choreographed the original production of Sideshow on Broadway, as well as the revival of Flower Drum Song, Bye Bye Birdie. He also captained the ship at the Radio City Music Hall Christmas Spectacular, done a ton of opera, cruise ships. This guy can direct and choreograph anywhere. Uh, and you started as a performer, is that right? I did. I was a boy soprano, so I played those roles from 1966 until my voice changed. Well, you started as a... Like I started a, as a kid. Uh, there's a theater in Brunswick, Maine that's on the Bowdoin College campus. It's still there. It's now the Maine State Music Theater. It was the Brunswick Music Theater, and I made my debut there in 1966 as one of Oliver's boys. I know that theater well because I was an intern there in 1993 at the Maine State Music Theater. Were you? Wow. Yeah, under Chuck cool. Abbott. Sure. Of course. Great stuff there. Indeed. It was my first brush with Broadway, you know, all the people that would come in every year because they were gypsies from New York and whatnot. It's a great, great experience. And then my voice changed and that was the end of that. Did you know, though, as a boy, like, oh, this is something I want to do? Oh, yes. Yeah. My mother had been in the business in, in her way and um, sort of infected me with the whole thing. So as soon as I heard the Oliver cast album and the Music Man and especially Mame, those were things I knew I would... I wanted to do. But per, as a performer at first. As yeah. a performer at first. And then I wanted to be a dancer. You know, just the roles changed. And so I returned to that theater before I moved to New York in the chorus. Um, a funny story. Uh, the, the choreographer they brought up to do Oliver in 1966 was this gypsy named Shelley Graham. Well, fast forward to 1975, we were doing Nona and Annette. Uh, and she also, in the interim, had become Georgina Spelvin of uh, The Devil and Miss Jones. So it was quite the education I received. <laughs> <laughs> so when did you decide you wanted to be a dancer? What age? Probably around 11 and a half when my voice changed. I knew, okay, well, that's not going to happen anymore. And um, I loved dancing. I had already taken class as an eight-year-old, so I just fell into that. And... Then came to New York with my mother on many trips and, and stood by the stage door and waited till Leroy Reams came out of applause and knew that's really where I wanted to be. And when did, when did you make the move here as an adult? At 75. 75. Um, Labor Day. 18. Tap shoes in hand. I, right off the bus. Yeah, graduated high school early, which was a polite way to say it. And I had no interest in going to college, which I regret now. But, um, really? I do. I do. I think that would have been a good thing for me to do, just to slow down a little bit. But I needed to come to New York, and there was nothing else for me to do, and I could dance, and so I had to find work. Was it, it tough? 
at first? It was tough at first. I got cast immediately at something at the old Equity Library Theater because of contacts I'd made in Brunswick. So that was a good way to say, okay, this is going to maybe work for you. And then I saw Chorus Line a few nights later and said, okay, this is definitely where I belong. You know, that was a game changer for me. And how quick before you landed your first Broadway show as a performer? It was not till four years later. Um, I, I'd done a number of uh, national tours and worked at Goodspeed a couple of times. So, so I earned that. It didn't happen right away. And then I was a replacement in um, 42nd Street, and me and my girl spent years on the road in Chorus Line and did that all over Europe. So I got that out of my system. And on New Year's Eve 1989, I said, that's it. I'm done with that. Really? I want to direct and choreograph now. And I'd done a bit of that many years before that as a teenager, actually. And uh, yeah, so I was ready to make that transition. You seem to be very good at reaching these ages or dates when you're like, okay, that's done. I'm going to move on to this next. Boy soprano, dancer, now dancer. What gave you the courage to say, okay, you know what? I'm done with this. I'm going to try something new. No courage, fear. I was running scared. There was I, I sort of come to the end of wanting to do long runs of shows. And I was not a virtuoso dancer. I was not Scott Wise. So I wasn't going to have that kind of career. But I knew I had an imagination. And while I was on the road with 42nd Street in the basement of the Schubert Theater in Boston, that's where pageant came about. Everybody was going to New York to audition for La Caja Fall on Broadway, and I knew I was not going to be a, make a pretty girl, so we were trying to find something alternate to do, um, and so we put on our own pageant of sorts, and uh, Dolores Gray played the reigning old queen in this pageant we did, and that was the beginnings of that. So by the time I had left um, dancing, a pageant was fully formed and had done an off-Broadway off production, and was looking forward to do a commercial run off Broadway. And Sideshow had already also begun to take shape in my head from those days in the chorus, having seen this crazy exploitation movie called Chain for Life, which depicted those ladies in, uh, in a not great situation. The movie initially kind of struck the John Waters funny bone in me, but after repeated viewings, I thought, no, there's a lot more here than that. So. I, I guess I had a couple things in my pocket, and I think that gave me the courage to say, I'm going to direct now. But So your, your path is a little bit different than many others that I've spoken to, actually, on this podcast, is that you didn't assist or you didn't, uh, someone didn't ask you to take a look at this. You were creating ideas yourself. Yes. I assisted Bayerk Lee. I mean, Bayerk taught me chorus line um, when I first went into the show, and she gave me the Bible, all of the different diagrams where people stand on stage, and I put together five companies of that. So I'm very grateful for that association, but I didn't assist as many people as I would have liked to. I would have learned a lot from that. But because I had pageant in one hand and sideshow in the other, and then I was given um, inexplicably at the time, um, uh, only because I thought it would go to somebody with uh, a much bigger resume, I was given the show at Radio City Music Hall in 94 and, and stayed there for six years and had the time of my life doing that show. Like that. that was a big car to drive, if you will. And I just figured it out, you know, learned from Ken Billington what it meant to really light a show. And it's a great experience. I mean, I'm just thinking about going from pageant in the basement to Radio City, the, one of the biggest theaters in the country. Talk a little bit more about pageant and, and the development of that. And again, what gave you the like, oh, I'm just going to put this show together. You had never created a show before. You had never done that thing before. Like what, how did it come about? What was the first step you took? Well, there were lots of shows I created in, the, in my barn, actually quite, quite a few of them. So I think my imagination had always, always been about assembling other people, bringing people together. Mm -hmm. And this just started as a lark. Let's put on a pageant where, you know, the guys are in dresses, but we're playing it for real. We're not going to camp it up. We didn't know from RuPaul in those days, so we were just trying to, to be these ragtag misfit girls in this pageant for this fictitious beauty company. I mean, it was absurd and fun, but I think the thing that distinguished us from a drag show was that it was about the characters we were playing. We were not trying to convince you that we were women or, or wanted to be, not that there's anything wrong with that, but this was our agenda. And um, I brought it to Bill Russell, and. Um, some collaborators of his, Frank Kelly and Albert Evans, and 
they ended up loving it as well. I mean, I, I can't say that the show was fully formed, but there were things in the show that we did in Boston. We did this next door at the Bradford Hotel, which is where people used to rehearse when shows would come in from out of town. And one day in between uh, Matinee and Evening on 42nd Street, we put this pageant on and filmed it. The videotape uh, was not as uh, successful as we'd hoped it would be, so we ended up doing it again six weeks later. And in that amount of time, it changed a great deal. And we, we became really serious about let's be committed to these characters. And we still were doing, you know, uh, public domain songs and stuff because we had no composers. But there was something when we brought it to Bill Russell and company that they said, there is something here. Let us, let us work on this. And so in 86, we did it down at River West as a showcase and sold out. Then it wasn't until 1991 that Jonathan Scherer, the producer of Forbidden Broadway, picked it up. And we did our commercial run, a little over a year run at uh, the Blue Angel. And it's still done. I'm so proud of that. The pageant is done and has been done all over the world and, and still sends a check once in a while. <laughs> nice. That's what we all hope for and dream for. Right. Uh, so I'm just thinking now, and then Sideshow, which is a very different idea than pageant. Yeah. What do you look for or what do you see? What, what is that special DNA of an idea that makes you think, oh, this will be a musical. This could be something interesting that audiences want to see. I wish I had a really smart answer for that. I mean, I think what, what my gut tells me is that how do I see myself in it? Where am I in this piece? And um, how do I relate to it? With pageant, not so much. Um, but with Sideshow and, and you know, growing up a gay boy with the last name Longbottom in Yarmouth, Maine, I definitely didn't have an easy time and sort of embraced my freak status, if you will. So seeing these girls um, you know, demonstrate such dignity about living and um, how they carry themselves and, and, and just, you know, made the best of things. It, it spoke to me, and I thought if, if there ever was a metaphor for how we need to make peace with that thing in ourselves that we can't medicate and we can't surgically remove, and maybe in the process um, we exploit it to our own benefit in the best way by embracing that. I mean, I think I fell hard in love with the idea of Daisy the Violet Pills. <laughs> And, and I knew there was something there. And of course, anybody I would say this to, what's, what you, what's wrong with you? That, that can't be a Broadway show. and that, That's not going to work. Um, but we took steps. We took it to Henry Krieger, composer of Dream Girls. So, you know, we said, who could do this? Who, who can write for women in trouble? And it's like, well, Henry can do that. He knows how to do that. And um, we fell in love and drank the Kool-Aid. And he and I and Bill Russell went on a Six-year journey from the time we began to the time we did our workshops and our readings and we opened on Broadway. It took that long, but it was a joyous ride making that show. And uh, when you say we came up, we had this idea. Who is we? Is it Bill or was it who's to the, do it as a musical? Yeah. Well, it, it was my idea to do it as a musical. It was Bill Russell figured out how to do it. Uh -huh. You know. Um, and but when you say we pitched it to Henry, we talk, like what? What's that team? Or was it just you? It was just me and Bill. <laughs> we had Henry over for cocktails and and pitched this idea to him, and he didn't run away. And he said, "Let me think about it." And he, he called back immediately. And said, "Yeah, let's tell me more." Which I had, you know, scads of research, and we watched that crazy movie, and and just sort of pitched what this might be. I knew it was never going to be about you know, prosthetics and convincing the audience that they were really attached. It was a theatrical device. And so the audience in my production kept those girls together by their own will. Um, that was important to me. And then enter Manny Eisenberg, who was, you know, just for him to be my first producer, pretty damn great. And he, he loved the show, fell in love with it as much as we did, and constantly would have to ask himself, I'm too close to this, and um, you know, it it got to him. It moved him. I think he saw himself within that configuration of those, that 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 messy situation of those girls, and um, they approved a workshop, six week workshop, and Manny said, "Would the Richard Rogers be okay?" Because it was empty. So we spent six weeks in there, brought in Robin Wagner's bleachers and a lighting plot. The entire crew there was on board, whether they should have been or not is another story, but they were in it. And we then did four presentations of it, which 
was pretty close to what the show ended up being on Broadway. And in fact, in some ways, I loved that workshop production even more. Mm. The, the, the down and dirtiness of it in that space. And then after that, the money came together and Manny came to me again. I thought we were gonna rehearse at 890. He said, would you mind rehearsing at the Brooks Atkinson? It's empty. So we were there for five weeks. And you know, the time of my life was running from rehearsal at the Brooks to lunch with Manny at the Polish Tea Room, uh, through the alleyway to the Rogers to see the loaded of my set. It was pretty cool. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so there, I'm, I'm sensing a little bit of a trend here, which is, is pretty exciting. Pageant, you have never done anything like that before. You make that happen. Sideshow is your Broadway debut, right? Yes. Director, choreographer, Broadway debut, about a subject that everyone tells you this is a crazy idea. Including my mother. Right, of course. <laughs> and who doesn't ask their mother, because mothers are the ones that go to theater and buy theater tickets. I ask my mom this, those kind of questions all the time. Flash forward, you even said it like, I had no resume for this, but they hire me at Radio City. What is it about you that is able to get these people to convince these people to do something that, frankly, they really shouldn't do? Like from pageant, I mean, you sound like an entrepreneur or, like, or a producer. What do you think it is that's making people say yes to you? What are you so good at? I guess I'm good at convincing you of how in love I am about something. And, and, and seeing if there's some kernel inside of you that can come along for that journey. You know, I love the Rockettes. I was committed to unison dancing. I got that. And I wanted to bring a, a, a sensibility of Broadway dancing over to them and to, to up the technique level. And I was very proud to be able to do that. Um, but I hadn't had a resume directing spectacle, directing 36 people, plus a chorus of, you know, what, another 25 and, you know, animals and whatnot. Um, but I figured out how to do it, and I think it had to do with my passion for it, because it wasn't on paper. Um, I, I do believe they came to see a couple of Easter Bonnet shows that I did the opening number for, and they were great opening numbers, by the way. One of them was at the Will Rogers Follies, and one of them was at Miss Saigon original numbers, original music. These were the days where they were spending too much on the show, which they don't do anymore, which is which is why we had full orchestration. It was crazy. But the people at the music hall saw those two things, which mm -hmm. perhaps helped them, you know, um, come to the conclusion that they're going to give me a shot. There was no multi-year deal. I knew clearly that at the end of 1994, I was either going to have one with this brand new number, rocking around the Christmas tree that we put in for the Rockettes, and... And it was good. And then each consecutive year that I was there, we basically changed that whole show, with the exception of Parade of the Wooden Soldiers and The Living Nativity, which nobody would touch, <laughs> you know. Um, and I'm really proud to say that TV commercial leads with the Santa Claus number, which is mine, it's still there. It's amazing. It's good, it's a good thing. Did you, were you nervous at all when you were transitioning from the tr from the performer to director and sort of telling people that this is what you were doing now? Was there ever a like, oh God, now they're, you know, I'm, I, everyone just wants to direct? Did you have that I don't know that fear? I did. It felt inevitable for me. I, I think I'm a better director than I was a dancer. Um, and I think I'm a better director choreographer than I am just a choreographer. I mean, so I, I had set myself to do both tasks and... Um, and the good news is that with pageant and, and sideshow, there was a cinematic way of telling those stories and, and transitions. I think director choreographers have an, a bit of a leg up on people that just do one or the other with transitions. We seem to be good at that. I don't know why. Um, and um, one thing just kept leading to another. I, I did have the confidence. I think putting up five different productions of a chorus line, the original staging on my own in 11 days, you know, gives you confidence to do that. You know, I did a lot of summer stock for a couple of years. So I'm, I'm, I felt ready, as ready as I could be. Um, and then um, I wasn't sure I was ready to do the Scarlet Pimpernel. That, that was definitely a big gamble for me because there was a lot of why would you want to do this? Are you sure you want to do this? But I, I fell in love with Doug Sill's performance, and I thought there was some great music in there and a good story. And um, the music hall was one of the producers. And they approached me, said, we'd like you to come in and 
fix this and do a new button on this number and rearrange this. And I looked at it and I thought, it's bigger than this. And it can be much better if we were to just relook at the book, which they had the appetite to do. And then that and I went to work and um, reconstructed that book in large measure. And Frank let us cut one of his songs, which was astonishing. Yeah, that was a very unique situation on Broadway. The show had opened. Opened it had run for run. six months. Right. Yeah. And then this was before the theater change or at the theater change? Before didn't it the move? theater change. Before we moved, this was a Ted Forsman and a bunch of other people with deep pockets loved the show. And there was an audience for it. Oh, yeah, I remember. But we rehearsed for two weeks at 890 where they were doing the old show. And we had some cast changes. So it was very tricky for them to go back at night, those that were staying with us, and do the old version. Then we closed down. Um... I think they threw at least another million dollars at it for new costumes. We had a whole new opening, some new set pieces. In the late 90s. This is in the so late 90s. So a million dollars yes, then, which is probably $4 million now. Probably. And then we closed down, um, went back into tech for seven days, reopened a few previews, and from my calculation, all but one critic changed their opinion, mm. at least in some ways. At least said it's better. It's better. It makes sense. I, I liked it. So I was really proud of that. And then it went, um, then we had to close the Minskoff and move up to the, the Alvin or the Neil Simon with a new set. We made it smaller. We took away some of the spectacle, which I'm not sure was the best idea. Mm -hmm. But it had a wonderful life on the road. And if you could say about, this is really specifically about Pimpernel, but obviously about anything you take a look at, like what... What was the one, if there was one thing you could say, here's what we had to do to make it better. Like, what was the one thing that you think it needed or that musicals need when they need to get to another level? I think it needed a better opening number. We needed an opening number that said to the audience, we know this is ridiculous and fun. This is a fairy tale. This is a, um, a romance novel. We want you to have a good time. It opened with a guillotine number. We moved that into the first act. We, there was a little number in the second act, basically background music called Story, Storytell, Storyland, um, Storybook, excuse me, apologies. And I said, let's take that and open the show with that. And the leading lady, who at that point was uh, uh, Rachel York, these beautiful costumes, let's just say to the audience, this is storybook, this is fantasy, we're suspending that kind of belief. And it, it just changed the tone of things. It wasn't a new number. But it, it made all the difference, I believe. And the guillotine was spectacular, but we needed to make you wait a little bit for that. Yeah, a guillotine number at the top of the show sends a very specific message, <laughs> I think, about the tone of the show for sure. And yeah, Doug Sills. And that was the reason to continue with the production. Do you, you've done some challenging material. Uh, do you think anything can be a musical? Do you think any subject matter can be a musical? And what do you look for specifically now when you're looking at material to work on? I look for things that move me. I want to see myself on stage. I love to have a good time in the theater, but I'm most drawn to being moved and being made to move off of my center, whether that's to make me feel uncomfortable about a situation, whether that makes me look at the person I've come to the theater with that evening and go, they're talking about you. Do you realize this? I love that kind of theater where it forces you to hold a mirror up to yourself and the world we live in today. Not everybody cottons to that. Um, and um, But in answer to your question, I think, at least uh, in theory, just about anything could be made into a musical, you know, because there are so many ways of approaching it. Um, that doesn't mean uh, it's always going to work. But I think... Um, somebody who's passionate about an idea, there's going to be other people out there who feel the same way. Who matters more, critics or an audience? An audience. And how do you get their feedback? You listen. You come to every preview, you stand in the back of the theater, and you listen, and you surrender to that wisdom. You know, and just because you, you think something is better at 13 minutes, when you start to feel them move at nine, you know it's time to cut that number down. And, and I think when, when that, this was initially brought to my attention, I think mostly by Manny, you know, instructed me to watch the audience, stop watching the stage. He was right about that. 
because there's nothing like it when there's just the sea of stillness and there's not anybody moving, which would happen any number of moments in Sideshow, any number of those moments. And, and I, I, I learned to really love those the most. Not the laughs or the ovation at the end of the Egyptian number, but those moments when they were just like, oh my God, um, they're really gonna go through with this. And uh, how are they gonna navigate the tunnel of love or this crazy wedding ceremony? Um, so I think you listen. Yeah, I remember being riveted. My, I saw that original production uh, right before I was, I think, working on the parade workshop. Uh, and it got this rave review from Ben Brantley, which must have been felt very good at that Indeed time, for sure. And the show had a good run, right? But not as long as you would have hoped or dreamed. How did you deal with that? Well, it was very, it was sad. It was very sad because we we knew there was an audience for it. What we didn't have was the ability to get a TV commercial out there. We could not overcome the Jerry Springer factor. When, that was not on our stage anywhere, but the people who saw the show the next day in their driveway, as soon as they uttered the words Siamese Twins musical, people were not interested in doing going to see that. And um, I remember Nancy Coyne came up with a wonderful idea for a commercial that showed Emily and Alice stage left and right the backs of these beautiful girls, saw them come on stage and come together. So you, the ick factor was just not there. And I think that would have dispelled a lot. Um, I never expected us to become the Lion King, um, you know, but uh, it's satisfying to know that it's had a revival. It's satisfying to know that it's been done all over the world in lots of different languages. That makes me happy. I always said that, that this life condition was not exclusive to Americans, you know, and there are a lot of people who feel this way. Do you, do you read the reviews? Sadly, I do. You do. I love my friends who tell me, I never look at my reviews, don't tell me anything. I'm distrustful of that. Uh, but I wish I could be that strong. Um, and you learn things from them. If, 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 if you can, you do. If you can listen. You touched on this earlier a bit, but I, I want to get a little bit deeper into it. We've, you know, some of the musical theater's greatest directors started as choreographers and then became director choreographers like yourself. Why is that, do you think? It has to go beyond the transition, the, the strength of transitions, which, of course, is very common to hear people say this, but there's got to be something deeper. What do you think it is? Well, I'd love to say it's as easy as that the being in the chorus is, in fact, the backbone of any show, and that being in that position, you get to watch everything from the inside out. I mean, I think that's how I learned. I remember... Being on the road with the First National of 42nd Street, and I missed an entrance. This was during a dress rehearsal because I decided to go out in the house and sit behind Robin Wagner and eavesdrop. Because I was much more interested in what was going on at that table than, than, than my entrance in the second act. Um, I get to work with him years later, which was pretty cool. Um, I think so many of these shows that you might have made a list of that, that, that these director choreographers have done are dance-driven, um, that that's a language in them. You know, chorus line of 42nd Street, and God knows all of Jerome Robbins, and so those are my favorite shows, and I think they do come from a point of view of movement is gonna tell a good deal of the story, and that's their currency. That's how they communicate, first and foremost. Um, I think that would be my answer. And what's your process for developing choreography. This is something I just don't think is talked about a lot. We know that writers sit down and write. We've heard about directors, many on this podcast, talk about their process. When you're designing an opening number or a number for the Rockettes, or so, what, how, does, how do you begin? Well, I begin with David Chase, usually. He's, he's who's I've begun with a lot in terms of music and storytelling. And he's a great storytelling and a teller and a wonderful musician. And we talk about you know, the purpose of the number, what takes place during the number. I mean, even at the music hall, when the Rockets did not come out to accomplish anything other than to really entertain you and knock you out, but I would still want there to be a beginning, middle, and end to it. Um, and David was always adamant about that in the musicals we did together. Why are we dancing right now? And why do we continue to dance right now? So it would begin with him, and we would sketch out a number, you know, use, using motifs from whatever song, you know, triggers the dance. And then I had a team of anywhere from three to four people 
that we would then you know, get in a room with David and almost always a drummer, and we would hammer it out, you know, sometimes with me dancing along with them, sometimes with me pulling myself out so I could watch it, but it would never be more than four people. Um, and we were able to, to figure that out. Um, Daisy and Violet were created on my, my two most cherished assistants, Tom Kosas and Darlene Wilson, you know, a guy and a girl, not even the same height, but that was all made on them. Over quite a few weeks, this doesn't just happen, you know, and I think anybody at a Broadway level is given that pre-production time, and I think that's important. But a lot of these numbers, I have to be honest, I see in my head before I even start doing them. And if I can't visualize them, I usually know mm, I'm stuck here, and why am I stuck? Maybe there's a reason we shouldn't be dancing. Um, but that's my process. I certainly, you don't do it alone, that's for sure. <laughs> Which is very different, I think, than a writer. a writer who stares at a screen all day, or even directors that are doing research and things. You've got to get in a room and play around. With and you've stuff. got to see it on somebody to know if it's any good. And it doesn't matter if it's the right sex or height or anything, as long as they're the right dancer. Do you have a style? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think certainly I, I adapt to what, you know, there was no Siamese twin style. There was no stuff for the ragtag. You know, I cast myself as the choreographer of the whoever choreographed pageant, that, that ragtag thing that took place. They brought in somebody, you know, to do this. So I try to put myself into that man's shoes because this is a man that would not choreograph on Broadway. This is somebody who was, you know, out there doing pageants in the hinterlands. And what would his vocabulary be? So uh, I think I've always sort of, you know, deliberately become invisible uh, as a choreographer to suit the story telling. Um, I think some of the the most favorite work I did as a choreographer was in Flower Drum Song, you know, and, and that that show, especially that opening number, the prologue of, of taking this song, A Hundred Million Miracles, which was a throwaway, basically, and using it. This was David Henry Wong's idea to, to use that as the immigration banner. That this is the song that helps this girl and all these people run from communist China to the arms of America to find a life. and. And of course, Fan Tan Fanny was just absolute pure madness and joy to do. <laughs> How do you think Broadway has changed since you got here uh, from that bus with your tap shoes in hand? Well, I think it's it's changed a lot, as, as we all know, and, and, and in many ways for the better. I mean, there's definitely a sensibility of creating things for uh, people that want to know what they're getting. They want to come to New York and they want an experience of seeing a show that they know a bit about already, whether they've seen the movie or the television show, it's important, I think, for the audience to have ownership, maybe more than they used to be willing. And, and I think just by practical standards, the price of tickets is so prohibitive to a lot of people that they can't just fast and lose. Well, let's go see this, and let's try this, mm -hmm. and let's go see this wacky musical about Siamese twins. It, it doesn't happen anymore because Theater, as you know, has become about event going um, for a lot of people, not for us who live here and make it our business. But um, so I think uh, in the, the climate we live right now, sideshow would never have happened. Um, you know, a, a producer like Manny Eisenberg would not have given me that kind of agency and freedom to follow your vision, which he really did. And I've not ever quite experienced that since. You certainly um, wouldn't have had two empty theaters to rehearse in. No. <laughs> and that was also a sign of the times. That certainly doesn't happen anymore. What a benefit that is. I mean, I, mean, I know Tommy Toon did that and other people have, but to be able to go up into the balcony without any sound system and just feel what you're getting, you know, as opposed to a room, that was, uh, that was spectacular. Do you like auditioning? I love auditioning. You do? Um, you mean uh, auditioning other people? Yeah. I do, because I remember what that felt like. I, I, I'm, I think I'm a good person to audition for. I have a lot of empathy. I want you to win, you know? So, and I love the possibilities that you're given, you know? Because nobody comes into a room to audition for a Broadway show unless they're at a certain level, you know? Nobody tells you you're good. You've got to be better than good to even be in that room. So you are, you are really honor to be uh, able to choose from the best this country has to offer in a way. I love that process. And I love when the relationship 
with the casting director is, is, is close and friendly. Uh, Tara Rubin and I go way back and have had great success together and great fun. You know, they, casting directors don't manufacture people. They all basically have the same Rolodex. It's so much of this business is who you like to spend time with, who you want to spend a day with. And, um, and that's important to me, to feel closeness and, and affection for people. What's the biggest tip you would give to the actors out there listening on how to deliver a more successful audition? Don't apologize for anything. I mean, if you really have a cold, then don't come to the audition. Um, and don't hold pages. No matter that you've been told it's okay to do that, if it's really for a role you want, showing me and the rest of the room that you've learned it is huge. I give you huge credit for that. Whether you make a mistake or not, um, not everybody agrees with that. Now, if you've given it five minutes ago or, or even the night before, but it means, it means a lot. It means a lot to someone take that extra step to do that. And don't come in costume. You'd be surprised. <laughs> Those are very specific and actionable tips. I love them. The the pages one is great. Of course, it shows commitment. It shows that like, no, oh, I, I memorize this because this is important to me. And you may get new pages every day in the show. So deal with that. Right. You know? Right. <laughs> All right. My last question, which is my genie question. I want you to imagine the genie from Aladdin comes to visit you mm. and grants you one wish. What's the one thing that drives you so crazy about Broadway that gets you angry, frustrated, could have you throwing things that you'd ask this genie to wish away in an instant? Just that the process of creating something didn't have to take so long to do. You want to work with the best people, then you have to deal with that. I mean, there's a project I can use as an example. Um, I had the idea of quite a few years ago to do a musical about Tammy Faye Baker. And it was clear that Kristen Shannon was supposed to play this role. And Henry Krieger is the composer. David Yazbek is just doing lyrics, which is a huge bonus for any show. And they're a great team, by the way. But we've been bedeviled by book writers, by finding the right one. We've made a lot of great choices, and we now have one we do believe is the right one, Robert Horn, who wrote Tootsie with David in Chicago. He's a great man, he's very funny, and we think we have the right team. Mark Platt is producing. So you would think with these elements... What a bunch there, of hacks all this, these people are. This I mean, should it's crazy. happen. This should not take so long to make happen, but it, it does. I would ask that genie for, for more opportunities to take people and not put them inside that bottle, but take them away to some sort of retreat and turn the phones off and just focus on that writing. It just seems life today, and, and you work with someone like David Yazbek and Henry, they're busy. Yeah, it's so funny. I, people always say to me, what does a producer do? And I say, my job is to get people in a room. And it's getting more and more challenging to do that just because of everyone's schedules and the amount of opportunities. There's more entertainment opportunities now. You can write for television, of course. You can write for Netflix and Amazon and commercials and all sorts of things all over the world that it just becomes harder to get them to get in a room. Musicals are hard. It's no surprise to anybody. <laughs> but we keep coming back for more. We have to. That's, that's right. Well put. Well put. Uh, well, thank you for that. And uh, thank you for being here with us. Pleasure. And thanks to all of you for listening. We will see you next time on the Producers Perspective Podcast. <laughs>